not receiving. I don't know if it's uh, <clears throat> I don't know what it is. Let me hear you, Justin. Yo, this is me. I'm talking. What's going on? Hey, everybody, have you heard the news? Weird things is happening, and it's also for you guys. My name's Snake. I'm a rival gang. Give me the drugs or I'll go bang. Oh, wait, we did. We had it uh, all stereo-fied for last night. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, I'm still I'm still not... Uh, l l let me check on my end to see if something changed on the uh, audio settings. Uh, uh, here, uh, let me get you to talk, Andrew. Is he frozen? Uh, he looks a little frozen. A little frozen. Maybe maybe he's uh, one of those guys who's really gifted at standing still mm. and asks for my change. Hey, I'm a human statue, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have some money? Hold my money, money pockets too heavy, heavy. Ninja turtle swag, swag. Bebop rock steady, steady. Bebop rock steady. <coughs> How about words now that I speak? Hey! Oh, Skype. What happened? Did you figure it out? Yeah, it was some device. It said, oh, your device settings, your microphone's not enabled, which I'm pretty sure that I said use it when I um, signed up. But anyhow, I'm here now. Woo! That's all that matters. Barely. Alive, gentlemen. I cannot wait to tell you the adventure that I had. Oh, right on. I can't wait to hear it. Not sure if I should say. An undisclosed location. How perfectly weird things of you. Those are the best. I'm going to, I'm going to, it got weirder when I went to go see where it said I was getting internet access from. I'm just going to tell you that. It's just, it's just, I'm lucky to be here. Uh, lucky to be alive. Dude, uh, that's awesome. All right, here we go. Let me boot up the uh, audio recording and then we could go get started. Doot. Test one two check. Brian's peeking out at points uh, negative six. Justin, yo, what's going on, everybody? <clears throat> this is what I sound like. Perfect. Andrew, I'm Andrew Maine, talking through my mouth. Right on. That's the best place to talk from. Uh. You gonna open the butt? Uh, yeah. Usually we haven't been, or it's not part of the. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, it's like we're not on the, one of the channels. We're on another channel. No, didn't we fix that last time? Mm, I don't recall. Neshcom. Uh, Neshcom's watching right now. Alpha Geek Radio Channel Three. Channel Three okay. should be good. Uh, broadcaster Three, and there is Neshcom said he password. fixed it. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, damn. 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 Guys, enjoy life. Breathe deep. Enjoy it, because you don't know how quickly it can be taken from you. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, not special event. We're going to do Alpha Geek 3, weird things, save settings, and theoretically connecting, and... Oh, apparently I fail. Yeah, it's definitely just saying connecting. Um, Sometimes that happens. It just hangs up. Just, oh, there it is. Oh, now. There we go. Oh, yeah. And then we're good. Fantasto. All right, Chief. Counting it down. Uh, we're ready in five, four, three, two. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Weird Things broadcast. I'm Andrew Maine. Joined by Brian Brushwoods. Hey, yeah, right on. We got two Brian Brushwoods. One by the name of Brian Brushwood. <laughs> I was about to say his good friend, Justin Robert Young. <laughs> oh, <laughs> barely made it. Yeah, Hi, Andrew. How are you? 
I'm good. As I said, I'm Adrian Maine. That's Justin you just heard, and that's Brian sipping a SpaceX drink right now. Sure am, man. Occupy uh, Mars. It's the hot new brand. Everyone's wearing it. Occupy Mars. That's right. I uh, Yeah, I, I'm wearing my SpaceX shirt right now. Um, Do you know how I so, can tell you're wearing SpaceX clothes? Because that's all you're I wear dressed. Now. All, <laughs> because all your I name is Andrew Maine. <laughs> yeah, it's unpredictable. I'm Homer Simpson that way. Uh, gentlemen, um... I don't know where to begin. Yeah, you, are you all right? You seem a little like uh, flushed. A little. You look frothy, like uh, like fresh milk from a from a sexy cow. You know, you know, I'm a man at adventure, and I set out to do things. Like I found Monkey Island. I'm not bragging, yeah. but I found Monkey Island. As one does, yeah. Yeah. You you you, I, you explore the wild terrain of of uh, Burbank. Yeah, I, you know, another attempt uh, with uh, Captain Loogie, we found a submarine in the middle of a forest, you know, probably mm-hmm. not a narco sub, maybe could be, not saying it was or wasn't, but Possibly. anyhow, yeah, we were in search of monkeys. Um, and I could go on about all my, my different adventures sure. and, and things I just do for you guys, really. I'm not a thrill seeker. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I just want information. I want to bring it back here. And on a previous podcast, we talked about Mars and lava tubes, the idea that if you wanted to colonize Mars, the, the deeper you go in, the more Earth you have and rock between you and the surface, the more protected you are from radiation. And short of building habitats and just covering the dirt, another option is to have tunnels. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked to we, we talked about from branding perspective, we wanted to call them Martian canyons so that you could just have lush yeah. green life all around you and, and a blue sky up above. Yeah, well, Brian, I was curious about this whole lava tube thing, and I decided to do some exploring. (laughs) I am utterly intrigued because absolutely nothing would surprise me. I think this would be a good time to let all the audio listeners know that uh, if if Andrew's audio seems different, it's because he is not, uh, at least presumably, sitting in front of his computer in sunny L.A. He is somewhere else. His normal SpaceX attire is covered by a very sporting jacket. Uh, uh, I mean, it looks he looks very Bear grills ish I feel like uh, maybe he just came back from slaying an elk or something. Yeah, and then drinking his own urine. It, it looks very, very, very rugged. So, Andrew, where are you, and what have you been doing? But gentlemen, I'm going to get to the where I am right now in a in a in a moment. I gotta I gotta get to that point, but I got to get where I've been and where I barely survived. So, uh I want to explore a lava tube. I wanted to see firsthand what a lava tube would look like. I've been one since a boy. You know, as a boy, I was, you know, I was a big explorer, exploring all kinds of things. Like, yeah, sure, my dad brought me there and my brother and my mom and all that. But really, I was the one, the driving force behind sure, that. Not yeah. to take well, anything I mean, away uh, from them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like it's not like they, they, they had already been there before you. I mean, you were you were probably leading the pack right yeah. from the beginning. Or, or, you know, holding up the rear, exploring, you know. <laughs> You know, mom, sometimes it becomes so overcome with emotion, it looked like tears. But anyhow, let's not get into my childhood. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, so I thought, you know what? I want to go to a lava tube. I want to see a lava tube and see what a lava tube would be like, you know, as an adult to explore for possible building, you know, a Mars colony inside of one. All right? Yeah. yeah. So I came all the way to, uh, to Oregon at a colleague here, and she said, hey, uh, Let's go explore a cave. Let's go explore a lava tube. I said, precisely. I said, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And so we went to Washington, and we're driving to this cave, and then I find out that it's a lava tube. I do some research on it. I'm like, fantastic, because this just meshes completely with what I want to do, the research for Mars. And we're driving to this lava tube, and a lava tube is neat. These things can be formed very, very rapidly. You have volcanic eruptions come, and then lava pours through underground, creating a vast tunnel. This was part of the network of lava and volcanic activity that formed Mount St. Helens, which I survived that Mount St. Helens explosion back when that happened, by the way, as a boy. I mean, I'm sure you did it through your, your, your grit and vinegar. That you yeah. yeah. I mean, millions of other people lived in the area, too, but I like to think that, you know, it was my example, you know. That, <laughs> well, that well nobody, nobody needs to minimize the survivor experience, you know. Like, yeah, everybody's yeah. got their own story, and yours is as valid as the next one. When I walked out on the street and I saw, you know, a layer of ash on the car, you know, it looked like doomsday. But again, having gone through that, decided to brave, brave forward, move forward and go explore a lava tube, which at any moment, knowing that hot lava could burst through that tube and fill it with lava, making it really a lava tube. But I yeah. want to explore it for the Weird Things audience. Right. So, yeah. you're, so you, you found a, a, a lot. I didn't know that, that you could just readily find those on Yelp. Well, here's the thing, is you can find lava tubes, but this is where it gets weirder, gentlemen. It gets weirder, all right? Uh, bear with me. So we're driving to uh, the, the 
the, the location of this lava tube. And my colleague uh, is you know, navigating as I survey the environment, the area around us. And then I said, you know, what's, what's the name of, the, the, of this area, by the way, we're looking for? And she says, you know, uh, it's called uh, Abe Cave. I'm like, oh, Abe Cave. Okay, we're driving along. I'm like, A-B-E? She says, no, 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 Ape, A-P-E, Cave. Ape like, Cave? Ape, Ape like, Cave. And now we're, now we're in, it's, and it's getting darker now. We started off later in the day because I'm a nocturnal animal, and sometimes it takes me, you know, I, I, my senses are the highest during that time of point. <laughs> by which you mean you're the most not currently sleeping by that time? Perhaps. So There's we're a lot driving of complicating along. factors. We're getting into, the trees are extremely tall. We're driving through the forest. We're in the middle of Washington, the middle of who knows where. And I realized this is actually near a location that I had in my book, Angel Killer. What? Uh, and now I know. I'm like, wow, this is familiar to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, I looked at this on Google Earth, and I kind of know where we are roughly. But anyhow, we're driving through this. No cell phone reception. So the cell phone bars start to die, yeah. right? Yeah. So we, we, but before we go there, I do a little bit of last-minute research on where we're headed. Ape Cave sounds like an unusual name for a cave, doesn't it? Uh, oh, no. It certainly sounds unusual. It also, to the ears of Weird Things listeners, uh, there are certain kinds of apes that have become very well-known uh, to those uh, you know who have followed this podcast for a while. So uh, I, I, my, my, my chest right now just listening to you is starting to tighten a little bit. Uh, so I look up Ape Cave, and I find out that Ape Cave was named for a group of uh, explorer, you know, an exploring club. They call themselves the Apes. But why did they call themselves the Apes? And I start to dig a little bit deeper and find out that there nearby is a place called Ape Canyon. So I ask my, my, my colleague, I ask my, my escort, I said, so why is this called Ape Cavern and Ape Canyon? She goes, oh, Somebody was attacked by an ape here a long time ago, or apes. <laughs> I right. said, really? I look up and I find out that Ape Cave near Ape Canyon gets its name from one of the most famous Bigfoot attacks ever, where a group of miners in like the 1920s claimed that, that a pack of wild apes threw rocks at them and, and assailed them, and they had to kill one of them before barely getting away. Wow. Wow. Uh, I'm looking at images right now of Ape Cave. Is this the place That's that you it. went to? Yeah. Uh, that looks pretty dark and ominous. This and looks terrifying. The only thing scarier than this cave is the thought that it's crawling with malicious uh, saber-toothed Just apes. for those of you who are only listening to this, this is uh, like a Guillermo del Toro yeah. kind of like uh, twisted evil curves. Uh, it is It is horrifying. So this is the center of Bigfoot country. This is the center of Bigfoot country that I find out that I'm going into a cave its name came from the explorers who then took their name from a famous, one of the most famous Bigfoot incidents there are. And there is some skepticism as to that event, that perhaps it was a bunch of teenagers throwing rocks at the miners that caused the altercation. Who's to know? Technically yeah. still apes, man. The most dangerous Tec game is what I call them. Absolutely. Now we're going there, and I understand now as we're heading there, it's already 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which means nightfall is coming closer. We come up to a road that is blocked, a blocked road. There's a big metal bar across it that's like, don't go any further. You're crazy to go any further. Just go back. Go away. You don't belong here, right? You see in the upper right corner, there's an image of an ape in a cave. Pretty much exactly what could have been there at any moment. <laughs> we parked, and I'm like, hey, let's keep going. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, no, let's go. Let's be brave about it. Um, I mean, the conversation, the roles may have been reversed. Ah, okay. Who's to say? Who's sure. to say? But anyhow, somebody but acted he, very Heat of the moment, heat of battle. You know, it's hard yeah. to keep an eye on it. Now understand, it's about to be nightfall, and we have the chance to go into a cave that's well over a mile long that goes into the deep bowels of the earth, knowing that when we emerge, it will be complete darkness, and we'll be in Bigfoot country in, in earshot of one of the most horrific, violent Bigfoot attacks in history. Uh, Do I turn around? Do I say, let's get back in the car and go back to the safety probably. and comfort? I mean, that would of, seem of to be a, re a, a realistic thing to say, but I, I don't think so. Uh, Andrew, I think that you were... Uh, brave and, and bold, and, and you sallied forth. We did. We did. We descended the stairs into the depths of this dark, dark, labyrinthian environment. I mean, some people would say because the lava tubes are completely straight line, you can't really call it a labyrinth. But, when you know, it's dark in there. <laughs> sure. Hey, look, man, we're yeah. not grading the difficulty no. of the maze. I mean, like, I mean, mine, yeah. mine, mine <laughs> plays tricks on you. you <laughs> yeah, know, man. Uh, the dark's a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. So... 
we marched forth, we sallied forth throughout there, and, and, you know, somebody complained because they were wearing Converse's, which weren't the best shoes to, you know, trek in. Some people. Not going to name names. It's yeah. not important no, who did it that. Didn't matter. Who, who, no. who complained. Sounds like uh, somebody uh, was was a real handful to, to explore <laughs> with. <laughs> you know, maybe somebody on the surface kind of bitches and moans and complaints, but really enjoys it nonetheless. Oh, I mean, listen, uh, yeah, the yeah. spirit of adventure burns strong, yeah. but sometimes the adventure that that person might be used to going on is going to Pink's Hot Dogs. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that, like, maybe when you're, you know, you get it, you know, it, was, it was an unexpected trip, which was delightful, so I didn't get to pack all of my complete gear. In fact, I just wore a pair of Converse <laughs> with no gear. treads on His the bottom. Go bag, anyway. Your go bag wasn't available at the time. Your no, bag. No. Yeah, all right. So we marched down into the cavern, and what's amazing is you get down into there, and you look up, and the ceiling is like 30 or 40 feet above you, and it's a very, it's a large, large space that just goes on and twists around for well over a mile long, and you have to think that, in, in all serious now, Mars is going to be riddled with lava tubes. We've seen from satellite images, we've actually seen 30 meter across holes in the ground that go into vast deep shafts that go underneath there. So we know that there, that there's just looking at from the surface, we can see these things. There's who knows what's going to be around it, particularly when you get around some of the more volcanic area. And remember, the largest volcano in the solar system is Olympus, Olympus Mons. Mons. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, which is on Mars. So so, so did it did it I I would have to imagine that it significantly colored your experience like after our lava tube uh Martian Canyons talk. Like do you feel like you could live your life just in Ape Cave? Um I again, I'm the guy that says I'm not going to Mars until there's a Taco Bell. <laughs> right. I would I would say that what you look at that, you realize that like you, it would be a good place to start from, and then from there you could be tunneling out into different directions. How many miles that, long is is Ape Cave? I believe about a mile and a half. Man, dude, that, so 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 roughly uh, like uh, what uh, Manhattan is uh, three three miles long, right? I think it's like more like seven or so. Okay, All right. Is it? I don't well, know. I could well, be mistaken. San Francisco is seven by seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so here's the way I think that, you know, what you would do is you would start, you'd take a mile and a half cavern, which would take a lot of oxygen to fill. So what you might do is you might start at the very, very back of it, put an airlock, and then as you can produce oxygen, whatever, to fill it, keep moving that forward and forward and forward until you have the whole thing filled. And then you would start tunneling sideways and in different directions and creating subdivisions. But you would start at one natural structure to build from. By, by Which, the way, Manhattan is, is two and a half miles wide, and it's, it's 13 miles long. So I, I was thinking of the width, not the length. I was wrong, too. But anyhow, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, but anyhow, but you get an idea that you could start building with you know, boring machines, things like that, which you could do. And, and you start thinking, what would, what, would you, what would you want to build? How would you want to live in a lava you know, You don't want to live in a lava tube and feel like, hey, I'm in a lava tube. You would build skylights, fiber optics, whatever, bring as much light in. You would put rivers or streams in the middle of it. You would plant trees. You would do that. Your houses. You know, I didn't you'd, even you'd think about getting natural sunlight in there. I guess it would be worth it if you had, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, in fact, you could gather more sunlight, natural sunlight from the surface, than, uh, than, uh, and, and condense it, essentially. So you get Earth-like levels of bright sunshine from, uh, from a Martian uh, uh, level mm -hmm. of, of, of solar activity. Yeah, you could build solar farms there too, and you could you could probably by that point digitally create a really really good effect of light. But yeah, there are a lot of a lot of things you could do, and you could you would I think you would try to build environments that would feel like the Shire from The Hobbit or something. You'd and you would have different regions. You'd want to create it. I think you'd want to make it more green than Earth. Yeah, I think you you, you know, that would be the goal. Is it so or, that you're or, there, or at least a, a more more green than urban Earth? You know, like yeah, uh, the yeah. cities that we live in right now. Yeah. So. Any of it. That was what thing was going through my mind, though. Is it would be cool to get, like, I'd love to, you know, can anybody out there knows where we can buy a lava tube? We'll put up a Kickstarter and we'll create Mars Camp there. Can you imagine? So, so, wait, the so level, well, uh, I mean, would, so would Ape Canyon, like, would, I mean, obviously you can't do it because it's a public park, but. Well, there's like, Ape Canyon and there's Ape Cave. Sorry, sorry, Ape Cave. Uh, would, would that be something like you, you see that and you're like, you want to know what? We could do Mars Camp and something like this. There are bigger lava tubes in longer lava tubes, you know, and that and that and that's a public that's a national park. But I got to imagine they're probably privately owned lava tubes. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, like the, that, that is something that, that you, you see you see the future that we could do something rad like, yeah, I in think something so. like I, that in a structure that bears a resemblance to that. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I think you could do I think you could build something very cool to give people an idea. What would it be like? You know, what would what would living and working in there be like? How would you do recreation? How would you how would you fit in there? And you can have bigger wider spaces but the idea to have something to start from that's already underground that you could because if you're 
if if you wanted to have a structure on Mars, you're gonna have a lot have to have a lot of thick radiation shielding, not including what you need to keep your air inside. Yeah. But if you're building inside of a cave, you can have things that are you know super thin, aluminum walls, whatever, and just to hold your air inside before you are able to pressurize the environment. Did, did we already talk about the fact that that your vision of the Martian canyons is? Uh pretty well pretty well depicted in the wrath of khan when they uh when they go to <laughs> genesis phase one yeah and they're inside yeah, the we, asteroid i think we made a comment like yeah we made a, a minor you know quip about that the idea of the genesis cave is kind of like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. but can, can yeah. you imagine though like uh you carve out let's say like a big uh you know our ar- arboretum or whatever can you imagine the trees that you could grow in martian gravity like just mm-hmm. unbelievably tall or, or, you know, super thick vines going up the side. Like, you could, I, I guess they could be attached at the top and go all the way down to the bottom and, uh, yeah. and look like the redwoods. We don't know how fast things will grow. You know, we might find yeah. that things grow much faster because, of, you know, earth plants might grow much faster because of less in gravity. Or it might grow unpredictable, too. Unpredictably. We don't know. All the more reason to start building. You know, there have been ex- proposals, too, to try to build, like, let's say, a space station that could have Mars-like gravity. You know, because you just spin it to enough to give you that, and there's there's that's in, in, a, in a very very exciting area that we live in now, that which we can realistically talk about doing these things, so, assuming that I ever made it out of Ape Cave, which do, uh, which for all <laughs> we know, yeah, they they replaced you with a replicant. Uh, well, go ahead. Do, well, do, do we have any best guesses on how much gravity you need to treat your bones right? Because that's the biggest problem with being in space for prolonged activity right now is that uh, your bones literally start to you know disintegrate. I, I don't know. I mean, some is better than nothing. And, you know, one of the things they try to do is they have, you know, astronauts do effectively like resistance training to try to keep putting pressure on there. And a third gravity might be fine. You know, a third gravity would be fine. And then, of course, that's going to mean going to the gym is going to be interesting because, you know, you're going to be benching a thousand pounds if you're a oh weightlifter. Oh, my God. Could you imagine that? that? That's amazing. Yeah. Bro, do you even lift over 1K? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, you, but you still have to deal with inertia and these other things on the joints, which will be, you know, still there. But that'll it'll change up. There's so many areas it's going to be fascinating to try to figure out what will happen. So we reach the end of Ape Cave, right? And I saw some things there that were quite – still can't quite wrap my mind around it. Little little holes in the wall where you'd see little things glistening back at you, tiny tiny glowing flecks of light. Oh, wait. You know? Were, were these, were these uh, bats? Bat eyes or something? I didn't see any bats. No, I saw like you know mi- weird mineral substances, things oh, like that. It. There's this rock they call it the boulder, the meatball, whatever, which perishly dangles over your head. As I walked through there and I looked up above me, I saw this thing and and narrowly jumped out of the way before it <laughs> stayed perfectly still. Yeah. Be- before it might have fallen right on you. Sure. Yeah. Well, any moment, really. It's a, it is it is a hanging uh, death trap. Now, you'll see many photos if you look this up, and you'll see people wearing miners' helmets and protective gear. I, nay, 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 did I wear any of that? Wow. Well, I mean, you, you know. didn't have your go bag, right? You know. I yeah, mean, I'm like, hey, I. Um, but also, he lives dangerously. I mean, he's he's a real rough rider, this one. <laughs> he's a real, real rough bloke. <laughs> yeah, here's a, here's a photo of me as I'm prepared to enter into. That's the Abe headquarters right outside there. You can see the look of concern on my face. Oh, dude, no, I don't see any concern. Well, that's, that's the I face of a man rough. who's ready for anything. Yeah. You know, that's the big part about that is, is you know, there's no way that you're going to, anyone's going to get the drop on you. Now, the following items are prohibited, prohibited in. Uh, in Ape Cave, uh, yeah. bananas, uh, smoking, pets, food, alcohol, fires, or fireworks. Which there go three of my defensive techniques right off <laughs> yeah. the bat. There, <laughs> you, you keep probably a, a good a, thing you left your go bag at home. <laughs> you yeah. keep a bunch of uh, Roman candles duct taped together on you at all times, Gatling gun style. Dude, if I could. Now, uh, I went inside there and I saw there were these, these shiny little rocks that look like stripper glitter. Yeah. Okay. I'll take your word for that. Okay. Yep. And then uh, I tried to take another photo of him, and I can't explain what happened there, gentlemen, but oh. it looked almost terrestrial. And I was reminded of the story, uh, the princess, a princess of Mars. Yeah. And how the, the passageway to Mars was found in a cavern. Oh, so you're like, you know, half ready. You're like, am I ready to take on my destiny to uh, to save a race of uh, green? Well, as, as, as I as Martian I remember, women? right, it was uh, a cave in, in the American uh, Southwest, so maybe maybe a little bit geographically there. But who knows how these uh, how these kinds? Oh, of Oh, I'm sorry, lives. I didn't know they only made one cave. I didn't know the rules, Justin. I, I'm saying, who knows how these passageways evolve over time? You know, 
Uh, also, minor quibble. It was a work of fiction. Uh, do, but I'm just throwing that out. I don't mean. I mean. Wait, 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 wait. Up. Was it, Brian? <laughs> it didn't claim to was be. It? You're right. It claimed to be the true account of uh, of what's his name on Barsoom. So, as I uh, journeyed further into this cavern and explored it and uh, looked for any signs of ape, I didn't see any obvious signs of it. But I had the sense that we were being followed. I had the sense that somewhere near us. There could be a presence there. Was that it a was family stealthily. from Pardon Ohio? Me? Was it a family from Ohio behind you? No, no, Brian. No, Wait. Brian. There's no. That, there was utterly nobody else in the cave besides us. Really? There was a couple people. There's a. There's a one. There's one patch. The lower cave and the higher cave. I said, let's go to the lower cave. Yeah. Even though the higher cave is supposed to be more dangerous, I said, no, we're doing the lower cave because <laughs> that just sounds lower. Yeah. The higher cave. There were a couple. There was a party ahead of us that went to the went it, down the steps and went to the higher cave, and that was it. We were the only ones in there. Really? That's got to be awesome. So no no other brave explorers, no tittering nope. teenagers trying to convince each other to not be a prude? Nope. Just me and my colleague, and we made it. Understand, you go, you start walking and walking and walking, and you're going, you're a mile underground, you know, obviously. And I checked just to be sure, iPhone don't work down there. <laughs> Now, did you, uh, like, whenever I could tell, like, I'm about to be signal-free, I always put it in airplane mode because I'm afraid of running out of battery in the meantime. I, did you do that? I, uh, I threw caution to the wind and then... He, too, He's likes crazy. to live dangerously. <laughs> yeah. So, as we're getting, as we're down there, I'm thinking, it was a 20-minute walk from our car to the entrance of the cave. And then the car was half an hour, hour away from civilization, from cell phone signal. So should one of us tripped and fell and split open our head inside the cave, it's when you start to think like, man, we're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, like, uh, like dude, uh, my, Michael Crichton wrote this essay talking about how nature's really not your friend and really no. actively wants to kill you. And he talks about how he was uh, uh, hiking in the Himalayas and there's a maybe a three foot wide, three foot deep channel of water. And they lay out all the safety gear and they act like it's the biggest freaking deal in the world to 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 walk across this this three feet of water. And he's like, I don't understand what's the big deal. They're like, well, let's say you slip and you fracture your ankle. Uh, it's a one day hike to the nearest village for us to go ask for help. And then we have to go to the nearest city. Then we have to send out a helicopter. You're looking at two to three days you have to survive. And if you have a compound fracture, that's two to three days with a bone sticking out of your skin. That, uh, yeah, man. It's like uh, when you're cut off, it's like, man, are we soft and squishy and dumb. Oh, God, yeah. No, we are yeah. the worst. <laughs> well, we, we reached the end of the cavern, and we saw some suspicious writings and, and markings there. Oh my god! Yeah, they may have looked like graffiti, the untrained eye. Perhaps they looked sure. to me. They looked like a lesser mind trying but, to, but, but some form of intelligence trying to express yeah. itself. Yeah, trying to understand the rudimentary structures of speech, trying to write things and described very carnal things, by the way, which you would assume that a Neanderthal, which really, if we talk about Bigfoot and all that, that's who I think we're really talking about, would be describing. You know, acts they would like to perform upon each other, or acts they've was seen it, perform, it, was, whatever. It was a, a biology lesson. Anatomy. Yeah, but it was. Well, it was I think more statements of power and dominance, and uh, mm -hmm. and 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 you know that, that kind of showboating to, to show mm -hmm. that they're they're the best. They're the yeah, best. and then and then and then very primitive, you know, hearts drawn with names inside them, which you know are would appear to be crude, you know, handwritten names, which would imply some sort of ritualistic ceremony took place there. So I saw all the signs of a primitive culture that you know inhabited that, and maybe quite recently, and then hid. Although it looked like there was no place to hide, who am I to say? There were upper chambers you could see, which looked like they could, you know, go off into other places. We reached the end, and then we hiked back. We made our way back to the end of the cavern. And I always had this thought, you know, thinking of, you know, John Carter and the idea of going into a cave and coming out into another world. And then when I had a chance later on, when we did reach the surface, it was nightfall. It was dark, but I fearlessly led us to safety um, with flashlights and maybe following behind but protecting the rear, nonetheless, I, I was, something felt different. Something didn't quite feel the same. I wasn't sure what it was. And then I started reading the reports of the Ape Canyon attacks. And the man who survived them said that he thought that perhaps these apes that attacked him were interdimensional beings. Really? Huh. Hmm? 
that maybe through some sort of, of John Carter-esque portal, there emerged these near-do-well uh, beings that were tossing rocks and uh, injured him and his companions. Well, and, and that's not, uh, you know, it's rumored that that's why you don't find any Sasquatch bodies, is because upon death they return back to their dimension. It's entirely, you know, it's an, I, uh, you know the word possible, you know, gets thrown around perhaps a little bit too liberally. <laughs> it is entirely something somebody would say or think. Um, all I'm going to tell you this is that is that before I was about to log on here and was thinking about the story and where does this end, I wasn't quite sure because well, am, I, am I still in the middle of the story? Is it still taking place? And then something happened. Uh oh. That, that that give me a moment here. I may I'm going to try not to lose the connection, but if I can if I can send this, I should have done a screenshot for Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, live right now on the Weird Things podcast, you're seeing true adventure with uh, the indomitable spirit of Andrew Maine, who fearlessly went to the center of the earth, braved the possibility of interdimensional Sasquatches to mm. search for you, and he's bringing us live first-hand accounts of the unusual things that happened afterwards. Moments ago, gentlemen, when it was time to begin this broadcast and it relate to the story, and there are many other little things, details that happened, which you'll be able to read in my novel, I Survived Ape Canyon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as I go to log on... And reading the stories about the interdimensional experiences of the miner who survived that ape attack in that very region that I bravely, bravely trekked into, I did a speed test to see how fast my Wi-Fi access was here. Of course you would. Yeah. yeah. Now that you have connection, we got to know how fast it is. And this is this is uh, this is where it gets a little bit weird, and I could sound Brace dismissive. Brace yourselves. Hold on to your butts. It when you do a Wi-Fi thing, it tells you what area that you're connecting through. It tells you what region, right? Yep. And I did a Wi-Fi check to see where my Wi-Fi, how fast my access was, and a location came up that was nowhere near me, that what? was many, many miles away, okay? That is over an hour away by car, but the city came up on my Wi-Fi and said, oh, this is, this is your internet access. This is who's connecting you right now. And? and I immediately recognized the city. I immediately recognized it. And it just, my heart stopped, gentlemen. My heart stopped. I began to palpitate and realized that perhaps I could still be back inside that canyon, that this all could be illusory, that perhaps this is not real. Or it is real, but in a way that I cannot describe. What did it say? Andrew, where is that city? McMinnville, Oregon. Type in McMinnville, Oregon. I want you to know, both audio and video listeners, I didn't have the cameras cut over. So there's this moment, you say McMinnville, and then like as if the, we're in a movie, Justin and I slow pan to each other and are like, McMinnville? Like, wait, what? Type in, type in McMinnville, and then these three letters, U-F-O. Oh, the most McMinnville. famous UFO sighting there is. The classic McMinnville UFO sighting. Photographs were taken near McMinnville, Oregon in 1950. <clears throat> the photos uh, were reprinted around the world, and I'm looking at them right now. They are uh, in, indeed uh, a, a floating object in, in what is uh, the grace uh, uh, landscape of, of uh, rural McMinnville. I'm nowhere near there, but some reason that popped up on my wife. That said, said this is the location. This is the location that we're routing all of your communications information through. Oh yeah, it happens to be the sighting of. I a mean, I don't want to jump thing. straight to crying conspiracy, but you tell me that it's just a coincidence. You tell me this just happens. I mean, come on, somebody's got to ask questions. Brian, I don't know what the answer is. I I know that I would have been dismissive a few days ago about Bigfoot attacks, and then I was there in the presence of a place. The people said these things took place. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, I, you can I, verify Ape Cave is a real place. And for all those people who are saying that the whole thing's made up, you want to explain to me how, where Andrew's been all day? Yeah, I mean, and this well, was, actually, technically, I I was at uh, Oregon City today. All, I was, it was all this, that day that that yeah, he it was, was there. Yeah, Friday that I was there. But and yeah, now rooting through a hub. Of UFO, uh, uh, well-known and documented UFO activity. You, you just, uh, you're just going to tell us it's all coincidence? With, with, with a, a near 70-year history? Oh, I'm sorry, officer. You're just going to, uh, no, yeah, let's just all go back to sleep and watch American Gladiators. I get it. All right, fine. Gentlemen, I wanted to go to a lava tube, a cave, to do Mars research. I did not ask. I did not ask 
to be find myself in the middle of Bigfoot country, and not just big, violent, violent, brutally violent, dangerous Bigfoot country, okay? <laughs> I did not ask to be there, but I found it. It drew me to there. I was pulled towards there, and then I was pulled into the cavern. The next thing you know, it keeps pulling me back in. Listen, this is easily the biggest confluence of weird things activity we have ever had <laughs> on this show, and, and I want to let everybody know that if you have enjoyed Andrew's tale of daring do, then uh, you could continue. You to, could fund to, these expeditions. Exactly. If you head on over to patreon.com slash weird things, uh, that is where we, uh, with the 417 patrons, are well on our way to our goal of $1,000 an episode. Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for helping us out with this. Uh, it is super huge, and uh, it has totally allowed us to take this show to another level uh thanks to uh bryce our our producer and everything which we have already brought on thanks to you uh we actually he actually got paid which is uh really rad so thank you very very much and uh thank you to everybody who's done it thank you to anybody who's gonna do it after listening to this which i think you should i mean listen if anyone's gonna peel a few pennies out of your pocket then this is the time to do it after listening to andrew's amazing adventure harrowing harrowing tale of what might have been it's glad i'm here guys it's glad i'm here to tell you the story (laughs) Gentlemen. Yeah. Yo. Uh, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Shoot. What's the closest star to, I was about to say to the United States, besides <laughs> yeah. the sun, what's well, the closest star to planet Earth? Same I mean, diff. Yeah, to the United States. Let's, you know, let's, let's call it like we see it, the United States. That's what we're <laughs> yeah, talking about. Right. Uh, the, uh, you mean which is the first to be annexed under the United States eminent domain? <laughs> what's, um, the, what's the closest star? Uh, Proxima Centauri, right? All right. So you say. Um, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Uh, during Julius Caesar's time, what was the closest star? Oh shoot, I don't know. Is it is it Alpha Centauri? It's probably Proxima Centauri. Oh, you know, okay. <laughs> during Neanderthal times, maybe just even seventy thousand years ago, what was the closest star? I'm going to say Proxima Centauri. Well, you would be wrong. Oh be- damn. <laughs> you would be wrong. An international team of astronomers, that makes it so much better, guys. Uh, <laughs> one of them was Canadian, you know. An international team of astronomers identified a star that passed through, this is from IO9, passed through the outer reaches of the Oort cloud some 70,000 years ago. It came within a distance of 0.8 light years, making it the closest known flyby of a star to the solar system. Technically, technically, if you're flying through the Oort cloud, which is part of our solar system, yeah, so so th- briefly, we were a binary star system? Well, they weren't in a gravitational lock, so technically it wouldn't be a binary. But it's called uh, Schultz's star. I know not to <laughs> <laughs> it's part of a It's part of a binary system. Its companion is a brown dwarf, kind of a failed star, reminiscent of a, ga- uh, you know, a failed star. You know what? Yeah. Okay, can we focus nice. on what they have done, not I mean, what they haven't done? Personally, I am not a fan of star shaming. Star so it, it came within 52,000 AU, that's astronomical units, to the sun, or 0.8 light years, that's 5 trillion miles, uh, extremely close. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't realize, uh, well, in 70,000 years sounds like yesterday. That's amazing. Yeah. So it may have, it, it was too dim to be seen, but it may be because it was magnetically active, it might have flared up. And it's now 20 light years away. But just, you know, the idea of thinking that our everything is sort of fixed in place, uh, you know, it's not. There's another rogue star. This is HIP 85605. We'll come close to our solar system in about 240,000 years. And um, it, it won't come any closer than 200 light years now. So that's not really that close. There's plenty of, light, plenty of stars closer to that. Man. But... But anyhow, they thought it was going to be closer to that. But anyhow, it's fascinating to think. We've talked about this before. There are probably more rogue planets drifting through the, through the stars, through the galaxy, than there are. Can you, can you slide my, uh, my image over? I'm trying to keep this. I know I keep moving this iPad around. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm doing that just because when I go full screen, it, it shows this other cluttered stuff on the side. But that's, that's cool. It's a ceiling fan. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so... That's it's a reminder, a reminder that, that the galaxy is moving. Things are an object. Things are moving back and forth. We talked about previously about how there may have been a 
you know, there may be still out there Earth-sized planets within our solar system, but way the heck out there that, you know, some scientists, some astronomers think that fit the calculations. Uh, I'm sorry, Earth-sized planets? Mm-hmm. So essentially, on this planet, presumably, what we're going to say most likely without um, uh, atmosphere, anything like ours, but certainly gravity close to ours. So if we were on this planet, what would it look and feel like? We probably would not have much of an atmosphere if any, so you'd be wearing a spacesuit, but it would be a heavy, heavy spacesuit because you'd have Earth gravity. You would look up, you would see essentially a nighttime star field, but, but with one star, how bright? Like as bright as... Maybe Jupiter bright, you know? Really? Wow. So it's like uh, not even Venus at sunset bright. I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing. But, but here's the thing. You might be standing on ice, and underneath that ice there could be water and there could be a thermally active ocean. And right. there could be wow. life. With swimming around things. And to these mm. critters, even if they, you know, it's, I, 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 what, now we talked about this, right? Um, you know, wh what are the odds of an under, underwater uh, creature bothering to, or, or having any advantage to develop intelligence? Uh, I guess probably about the same as on Earth since, and it could be, you know, it has been debated that, dolphins and uh and whales are are smart uh, do you think they're as smart as humans well, I, th I think what, what we've talked about in the past has been their ability to crew to keep history right like that 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 being yeah. a defining element of our civilization is that we are able to build on our past beyond what our natural intelligence is and what separates us from other you know animals on this planet and whether or not they would be able to do something like that yeah we don't i mean we had we've talked about this before a lot is it thirty thousand forty thousand years ago there were half a dozen different hominids walking around on Earth, and we were just one of them. Neanderthals, Denisovians, Red Deer Cave people, Homo thuringiensis. There were there were many descendants of Homo erectus and offshoots, things like that. And we don't know what went extinct. And this is an important thing to remember. Up until about 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, this century, there was no fossil record for chimpanzees. Uh, this is just because, oh, you're, you're saying they weren't old enough to be fossilized. No, they just didn't live in regions where they could be fossilized. Got it. They were lived in very heavy marsh environments. So we hadn't found any fossils for chimpanzees. Every fossil that we have right now of a chimpanzee going back, you know, more than a few hundred years or whatever, fits in a shoebox. Wow. That's insane. And, it's, and we can genetically, we can look and we can see that we can, and we understand when we look at the regions of which they came from where they're around, these are environments, they're, they're humid, jungle-like environments that just don't encourage fossilization. Things, if you die, things eat you, scatter you, whatever. They're not living in environments where you're able to find it. So we don't know. You, you only find fossils in environments that are really good for creating fossils. Fossils are the exception, not the norm. So when it comes to human ancestors, we, we found traces of six or seven. I guarantee you, I promise you, as far as distinct species, there was probably three it's three times as many or more different kinds of separate groups that we will only know about when we start. We only know about it if we find that they've interbred with us and we can find it in our DNA. And that's what's been happening as we go look into our DNA for the most part. Either we find fragments, we find DNA in there, or we look into our DNA and we see that, man, this thing came from some group. We don't know where and when, but this just popped out of nowhere. Man. So. Uh, the, uh, how, how far back does recorded history go? Do, uh, like 10,000 years? Is that about right? Or... I mean, it depends on how you, how you define, like, like as far as like written language and like, you know, this happened to this happened and this happened, you know, it's a few thousand years, you know, it, it's once you, you pray, once you get pre Babylonian and stuff, there's just, you know, there's a lot of myths and things like that in the oral histories we know, but it's harder to find, but we have the oldest, the, you know, the, the oldest structure we know of now that predates everything. And it's, and it's a quite a recently, recent discovery that, is only getting uh, you know more attention now is Gobleki Tepe, okay, and that's in uh, in Turkey, and this is a region that dates back twelve thousand years, okay, the tenth millennia BCE, okay, and it was abandoned. It was goes back twelve thousand years ago. It was abandoned ten thousand years ago. Holy cow! Okay. And we've only uncovered a tiny, small part of it, and we find massive stones there. And this was an environment that was radically different. When this thing was built, Doggerland, that region between England and France, which is now underneath the water, underneath the channel, was above ground, was, was a fertile 
area in which people lived and thrived. You can actually have your DNA. Like I check, I have, I have, I have DNA that probably went, goes back to the people who lived in Doggerland, as do many people, you know. And, and that's an entirely gone region that would inspire one of the many Atlantean sort of myths. So these people were even prior to Doggerland going under. They were around probably three or 4,000 years, and then the you know, environment changed. But this could have been a very fertile effort area. This, this predates any of the Middle Eastern settlements we know of. Of course, those things are built on top of each other. I mean, I guess, I guess the reason I was asking how far back our, our history extends is because it, it, it utterly fascinates me. And I find it so remarkable that, that given the trajectory that we may be on, where for the next thousands and thousands of years we leave Earth and we expand forever and ever and ever, uh, essentially, just as, uh, you know, I, I think Twitter is a remarkable tool in that it's the, when Twitter started, the world started keeping a diary. You know, we have this yeah. record of everything people are chit-chatting about, and uh, everything before Twitter is going to be kind of a black hole or whatever eventually comes to supplant Twitter. Uh, so like, let, like, me just get, oh, let me just run for a second. Sure. There are structures here that weigh 20 tons, that weigh 20 tons stone things that were erected. They have done topographic, topographic scans there, and they found, they found structures, built structures, 15 thousand years old and this is not some fringy weekly world news thing this is yeah. an emerging thing we're looking into 15,000 years old which is 10,000 years before we really had agriculture that's amazing well and I guess I guess so so it's uh, we talk about the ability to maintain one's history is so important you know especially you know to, to, to build uh, on on the knowledge of those who came before uh, I mean essentially to know that that we are the generation where pretty much the, this level of fidelity moving forward begins and that our words, even now as we speak this, have the possibility to survive as perfect as they are right now, you know, for, for 10,000 years is, uh, I don't know, shocking. We, and, we, and we, we hope, you know, we hope. And you, but you have to think that 15,000 years ago when they start to build these big massive stone structures that were unparalleled for, again, 15,000 years ago, they're building stone structures, okay? And it's hard. I mean, you're, you know, Neanderthals, we think the last fragments of Neanderthals, we think maybe went extinct 30,000 years ago. That's the last time we found things that looked like they're tools above the Arctic Circle, but that doesn't mean that they didn't last longer. And, and they could have read, you know, there are, when you start reading reports and accounts of explorers from Alexander on forward, you find people going to areas of India and other, word, other places and encountering very strange people that yeah. could have been, not necessarily Neanderthals, other things are like that, but 15,000 years ago, there may have been other hominids at that point. Wow. That's and so, insane. And, and yeah, 15,000, I'm just thinking 15,000 years ago, here you are, you're, you're building the structure. It's a massive, you know, it's a big complex. It's the biggest, most impressive thing anybody's ever seen. It's a high point of technology. If you lived near there or you're a part of that, you have to think, man, you know, we're kind of special. But guess what? After that decline, it was ten thousand years before anybody came close to that again. Man, that's, and, well, that's that is that is insane to to wrap your head around. And also, it's like from what you said, like this is you know so far before we know you know like we assume agriculture. You know, the agriculture we know today is in practice or the earliest forms of it. Like, and yet they survived. Who knows what elements you know that we have since rediscovered. Uh, that they had at the time, and it just was not something that carried on. You know that that they they died out. What they did, you know, is is something that we no longer have, and it's not recordable enough to know what they were doing to survive so long and so mm -hmm. fruitfully. We've only uncovered five percent of it. Wow. Ah, uh, man, I just I don't I'm know. just excited to uh, base a fad diet around it as we discover more and more about how they survive. <laughs> yes. yeah. Understand. How do you think these guys lifted 20 ton blocks with their bare hands? <laughs> Read my seven secrets of diet to find out and subscribe to my newsletter. Gentlemen, do we want to do another weird thing or do we want to go into picks? Yeah, I've got do. another weird thing for you. A quick oh, weird thing. Dude, bring it. Let's go. Dive in. We're going to go back to Mars for a moment. Go ahead. It's where I want You know what live. I like about Mars? What? Everything. Mars is full of mystery. It's great. It's great. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, a couple days ago, uh, not, a, not a couple days ago, but recently on Mars, um, something happened. Oh, wait a minute. I saw this. This is this, uh, 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 the headline, and of course, you know, headlines have a tendency to overstate things, but like the mysterious plume on Mars that nobody knows what it is. Mm -hmm. Is this right? That's it. 
So what, what, what is the story about it? Uh, well, you know, the, the, on, on this is Fizz work that came from Cloud Over Mars, the scientists baffled. Plumes seen reaching high above the surface of Mars are causing a stir among scientists. As one might expect, oh, sorry, Mars. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Only yeah. Known so, inhabited yeah, crap. Robot. Yeah, that's freaking uh, autoplay. Autoplay video. Sorry, you were saying. So they found there. We've we've imaged plumes on Mars that are like over 250 kilometers tall. Okay. <laughs> now, what is it? We don't. What are these plumes? What are they? We don't know. They, we have theories on these things, and it's not like scientists are, you know, are completely like, I give up, guys. You know, I became, you know, an astronomer, astronomer, an astronomer. trying to say astro astrophysicist. I became an astronomer because uh, I wanted certainty, you know. But no, I mean, it, it's like I have they have theories and ideas. We don't yeah. know, but we know that, you know. I, I, but but just just to go back to the headline, I just love like leave scientists baffled oh, as dude. if like it that's is fizz dot org too, though, like you know. And, I mean, the, and everybody else in the internet age, like, how do we, okay, they said baffled, we'll use stumped. Right, well, and, it's, and, and, like, it, it's, it, it, like, it's such how a... How about leave, leave science with their thumbs up their butts going, what happened? Well, exactly, like, <laughs> ah, I just, I don't know, I have no idea. <laughs> they're running around Explain the hall that going, ah, fine. Ah, like, they're all waving handkerchiefs around, like, you know, like, oh, they, well, I have no idea. Man, blah, blah, you're blah, blah, blah. so right, there's this weird smugness to all of these headlines. Scientists can't explain massive Martian plume in your face, scientists. Mysterious Mars plumes defy explanation. Mystery Mars plume baffles scientists. Uh, and, Mars plumes. Why the low resolution? <laughs> Nobody and, and knows. That, that actually might be the, the most relevant headline, by the way. Like, at least it's yeah. like, hey, look, like, it's, it's hard to look at what this is, you know, which might cause the, the mystery. Anyway, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, again, and, and this is one of those things that for scientists are, it's like, they're like, good, this is awesome. They're excited yes. because it's like, you know, this is a, a – they're not like going, oh, God, everything I know has failed. It's like this is, this, is, this is why you become a scientist is for these types of things. And we, we have theories and stuff, but we don't know. And, and we, there's a lot of things on the surface of Mars that we have rough estimates of what caused them, and then we have disagreement. You know, we talked about before there's, you know, one – you know, we have a, a uh, microbiologist, geologist who looks at some structures says, nope, this is, this is caused by microbes. Another one's like, no. You get those, you've seen those weird spider crystals that form in the southern hemisphere? No. Wait, uh, oh, spider type crystal? Mars spiders. Crystals Mars. All right, spider crystals Mars. Uh, I definitely got a video game. Uh, no, no, like type, no, not spider crystals, just type Mars and I think Mars spiders. Mars spiders. Let's see. Oh, wow. Uh, are, are, are you talking about these right here? Yep. What are those? They're aliens, Brian. They, they're well, I know. I mean, they, they look like, uh, I mean, I guess they're crystals, natural formations. Um, I, I, Probably I, I, I it don't could have be sense... CO2, you know, with CO2 burgeoning from the surface. Um, but when you talk about what's cool about exploring Mars is what are these things? Uh, yeah, dude. I, I, I don't have any sense of scale from this. I, I, if you showed me this picture, it could be from a mile up or it could be with an electron microscope. I honestly oh, yeah. have yeah, no there, sense. Yeah, these things are hundreds of meters across. Okay, so this is high, high up then. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes me feel better, strangely. Yeah. So. Otherwise, I mean, this could be just a close-up of my pockmarked skin when I was a teenager. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So another one of those little, you know, we have, again, there are theories, there are explanations to what these things could be. Whether or not we're right, we don't know. Till we go there, we send more probes there. We don't know. Uh, so this is just uh, out there in the world. We, we don't quite know what the hell is happening, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. I mean, it, that looks like that plume could be, uh, it could be, uh, if you have, Mars has tons of frozen CO2. There's water and has tons of frozen CO2. And it has volcanoes. We believe, we assume the volcanoes are long extinct, long dormant, that all that tectonic activity is shut down. Maybe not, maybe it has, but you might have vast caverns of CO2 that might all of a sudden start to heat up and then might expel, you know, and, and just create a little fissure that all of a sudden, all of a sudden you have this outpouring of CO2 that rushes out there. And you've got to think that something that can shoot, you know, that much of a spurt, 250 kilometers in the sky, you know, is it a CO2 volcano? These are things we don't have on Earth. What do we compare them to? A geyser, you know? So that's the beautiful thing is that Mars is similar and it's alien. Or, of course, 
<laughs> All right. Uh, you guys want to do picks? Let's do picks. Man, I, I actually, uh, I mean, uh, can, can we all just agree? Can we take a moment to geek out over Better Call Saul? Are, are we all watching that? I haven't catched the last episode, but yeah, I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, that, that'll be that'll be my pick then. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say Better Call Saul. <laughs> I'll take your pick, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know, because we had this we had this this conversation that uh, I think, like, we are both excited. I, I am probably more excited than Brian yes. uh, at, this, at this point in the story. But the third episode... Uh, to me, what well, I guess what makes me excited is the exponential growth of storytelling and storytelling and character possibility that continues to happen episode by episode uh, and where that trajectory is and knowing that I have faith in these storytellers from Breaking Bad. Uh, I guess that's what, what really, really makes me excited is that the third episode just takes that character, those character elements where now everybody that you've met continues to become more interesting, more well, more nuanced, uh, you know, can go in different directions. You've now got six or seven people that all could take you in different areas and all of them would be interesting and fun. And we continue to see this weird fun house mirror, uh, you know, a story that is paralleled on, on some levels with the Walter White kind of descent into uh, darkness that we saw in Breaking Bad. And uh, with with Jimmy McGill, we see somebody who is certainly not, well, I guess maybe more transparently flawed at, at, at the beginning, but who maybe have more of a, a pure heart at the beginning of the story than we kind of uh, learn to know Walter White as. So that... Uh, yeah, I guess that's one of the things I appreciated about it. With my, I took me a while to get into Breaking Bad because it was clear to me when I started watching, oh, he's a bad guy. He's a guy that wants an excuse to do – he's – between doing good or bad, he's going to choose bad because he's angry at the world and these things that, that were – He spent so much and, time being powerless and, and – yeah. yeah, that, that Vince Gilligan – and I didn't know that Vince Gilligan really intended that. I just thought it was just – you know, at first I'm like, wow, well, do the writers realize that – their 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 anti hero here is more anti than here. And then once our no, they know no, Andrew, we got this, you know. And then I go, <laughs> oh, this is this is this is exceptional. Now that I, now I will forgive a lot of where I, it's hard for me to relate to him because now I understand. Whereas Better Call Saul, it's sort of a he wants to he really is in many ways trying to be a good guy, but he keeps putting himself in these bad situations, and he's addicted to the power that yeah. he has when he's in these horrible situations. Uh, and. And that continues. He just uh, it's it's one one thing after another of like just these specific to his failings, uh, you know, these these things that happen, which are, are really great. And also, uh, you know, I'm I'm I've never been this excited for any kind of prequel story ever. Well, I, I mean, I I, I, again, again, here's the secret to running good prequels. Uh, is to tell new stories that just happen to be set in the same universe. And the fact, which, by the way, it's an interesting situation because uh, you, you can kind of tell what year it is by the phones. Like, phones have become this cultural touchstone that immediately clue you in to whether it's the early 90s, the late 90s, the early 2000s, or yeah. modern day. And Certainly over the last 30 years, you can you can immediately set a scene based on the phone that somebody pulls out of their pocket or picks up. Yeah, but I mean, like seeing uh, seeing the scene when his brother comes to visit uh, uh, Jimmy in in prison. Uh, you know, spoiler alert. Oh well, I mean, it's it's okay. It's a brief set piece, but uh, but regardless, it, it it clearly takes place like in the late eighties, early 90, 90s. Well, that, I, it, it, it's the first scene of the show, and and the first p shot you have is of a gigantic brick phone. Yeah, which is yeah. like it just immediately tells you, all right. Like we are in a certain we are in, in in a certain point, which is so funny that now that we're in 2014, it is different than these scenes, which is modern day for our story of Better Carl Saul, where people are using super crappy flip camera phones, right? Uh, because it is it is further along, and now we are so far into the the modern smartphone revolution that uh, that looks like that immediately puts us into a a certain point in time. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's great to see vectors emerging that, um, you know, one of the things that uh, was awesome about Breaking Bad and The Shield was having these kind of nested problems within problems. And you knew you can't go to this person because of this. But, you know, and, and, and as we're getting more of this backstory and we're starting to hear, you know, uh, I don't know, some of the backstory on Mike uh, er Ermitrout and uh, uh, 
whatever, you know, him being caught I, in a little lie that causes him to yeah. deal to deal with Nacho in a certain way. And I don't know, you feel you start to see those threads coming. Uh, you start to see the landscape of what we're going to see over the next however many seasons. And I think it's 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 so fun to see maybe the best people working in television today at suspense storytelling with Breaking Bad, which became, you know, it elevated that to such a gigantic level. You know, like we never, you, know, you look at other, like, you know, The Wire, The Sopranos or something like that. Like there were, there were rich, complex ideas that I think and characters that carried uh, those, uh, you know, probably characters with The Sopranos and storytelling or uh, with, with The Wire, but none of them had the like, tear your heart out of your chest suspense that that Breaking Bad had. And it's like when you realize they're still in their prime and they're still telling these kinds of stories and they can just so effortlessly kind of turn this knob and show like somebody's face or reaction or put people in a certain uh, sense where you're like, oh, my God, like I am just preparing myself to be suffocated by this. Uh, it's great. And everybody should watch it. Yeah. Uh, we we also I guess we talked a, a, a bit about Better Call Saul last week. Uh, we had already talked about Bold as well, right, Andrew? Mm -hmm. Are you continuing to read Bold? Finish Bold. And 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 how, how were you left with it? I thought it was very bold. Bold. <laughs> bold. A one bold. Uh, no, I think I think I highly recommend it. I I think I really encouraged it. You know, I I have my my little, you know, my minor nitpicks, but it's more like. You should put this on the wall here. It's a beautiful house you have here, you know. Right. Um, but you put the carpet on the ceiling. But other than that, no. Um, <laughs> it's it's great. I think I highly no. Yes. Right on. Uh, all right. I guess my pick is going to be. Um, I'm doing a bunch of uh, uh, the great courses, and I just finished uh, uh, behavioral economics by Professor Scott Huttle, uh, which is uh, about the. A lot of it will be familiar territory if you've uh, listened to a lot of Radiolab or, uh, uh, you know, read a lot of Freakonomics stuff or listened to the Freakonomics podcast or even read, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Zak's book about um, uh, oxytocin. But, uh, you know, it's the psychology of, of uh, you know, the dictator game of the, uh, 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 well, what's the... Um, What's the one where it's like you decide how much money gets played? The ultimatum game, uh, a bunch of, uh, I don't know, these a lot of game theory in there that's really interesting. And now I moved on to um, uh, Professor Stephen Novella's course, which is Your Deceptive Mind, a scientific guide to uh, the neuroscience of, of your brain and how you trick yourself, of critical thinking st skills. That's what it is. Uh, and I'm enjoying that quite a bit as well. All right, uh, my pick um, is a book. It's also an audio book. It's called Bold, and <laughs> it's by Peter Diamandis, written with Stephen Kotler, who narrates the audio book. And uh, Brian and I have talked about this before. And uh, by the way, I'm in the middle of a or started an abundance, and an abundance to me, I highly recommend abundance. But abundance could be, if you've read in a certain area of stuff, it could be a summation of everything else you've read. And you're like, yep, remember when they wrote that and they said that in that book? Yep, remember when he said that in that book? Yep, remember when he said that in that book? But it's still a really good, you know, good listen or good read. But bold is, you know, bold as they took those ideas in abundance, the idea that we're living in an exponential future. Things are just radically getting cheaper. Things are falling in prices. And there are problems to be solved in this world. But these problems are going to be solved with the tools that we have at hand around us that we just have to see what they are and understand how the world works. Um, I think it is, it's absolutely a, a very inspiring and exciting book to read, either if you are somebody looking to start a business or somebody who just want to understand how rapidly and how quickly things are changing. And there is, there is among, I would say that starting from the tech industry and people in software in particular, emanating outwards, there is this wave of optimism that is unprecedented that is just maybe not since the 1950s have there's been a group of people that are so outwardly optimistic about where things are going and other people are just not quite getting it, understanding it, but these optimists are billionaires and they're people who are doing amazing things. When the world's largest advertising company is building robotic cars and investing in outer space projects, i.e. Google, that's pretty incredible. When you have the guy who is the, you know, the number one retailer in the world has created a company that is now a competitor for sending astronauts into objects into space. Jeff Bezos 
it's pretty optimistic and amazing to think about that, that the three, three of the biggest tech companies in the world are heavily invested in space exploration, that in materials manufacturing, that this is the world we live in now. It's, it's, it's exciting. You know, now Apple is five years away from maybe releasing a car. <laughs> it's yeah, no, insane. it's 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 insane. Uh, what's the part that really stuck with me is the very pragmatic, uh, straight face, serious, practical advice of if you are going to build a business, make sure you build your business plan right now, assuming that uh, that that computational power is infinite and free, that bandwidth is infinite and free, that storage is infinite and free, and now we're entering a world where creative problem solving power is becoming infinite and free, or at least trending in that direction, oh, which is unreal. And, 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 and to give you an idea of how these things are changing so rapidly, like right now, you can go to Tinkercad, which I talked about before, Tinkercad, and you can, you can start designing. It's a wonderful, wonderful environment for doing three-dimensional design if you want to create 3D products to make. Within Tinkercad, once you've made your little gadget or your hood or whatever you want to make, there is a button you press that will then allow you to choose from one of four companies that will then make it and send it to you. And, you know, to have them send you a prototype or whatever on one hand might seem, you know, it's not competitive with something you would just buy from Amazon, but it is extremely competitive compared to what it would have cost years ago to have somebody send you a prototype. Yeah. It's really, really, really comparatively cheap. Those prices are going to continue to fall. You're, you're already getting right now, there are, dump, there are a bunch of different there's Make XYZ, for example, which is a company that you can upload your file to, and they'll find somebody locally and give you a quote to have them make between one and 20 copies of something. It ends up being pretty inexpensive. Those prices of manufacturing are going to fall because 3D printers are falling and, and materials are falling and they're becoming more redundant. You're going to get to the point very, very soon that, you know, you're not going to. The problem with Kickstarter often, many Kickstarter projects fail because they have a great idea, they prototype it works. Then they go to China to have it built, and they're totally inexperienced with how to get things done in China. And, and part of the reason is, is that, you know, 5% of the companies there make wonderful stuff. 95% of them do not. And every one of them will give you a great first one off the line that you think looks great. But when you look at the next thousand, you realize they're not. And it's, it's a manufacturing issue. But in any event. Trying to deal with any kind of overseas manufacturer is problematic, and when many of the Kickstarter projects have to deal with that. But you're getting to a point soon enough where the 3D prototype or the 3D prototyping devices will be able to make stuff that you can mass produce inexpensively. People are putting together farms of maker bots, of replicators, the, all of a sudden, and they're in cities. I mean, there's, there's a dozen of them near me in L.A., and there's several around here where I am right now where you can just say, hey – Maybe, let me go send this to you, and I'll come over tomorrow afternoon, and I'll pick up a bunch of these manufactured items. So it's not just you know information stuff that's becoming this way. Manufactured items are becoming rapidly easier to produce, and we're going to live in a world that's a radically different kind of thing. When you order something from Amazon, and you either print it yourself, or if it's a little bit more higher fidelity item, maybe you know there's a replication facility a mile away. That produces it in an hour. That's the uh, the strange paradox when you think about like if you let's say you're a small business entrepreneur and you realize oh my gosh if I get a 3D printer then I can print things and sell it and it'll be awesome because I can make a whole bunch of things and then sell them and make money. But then you realize in a world where you have a 3D printer, everyone else has a 3D printer, and who are you going to sell it to? And why would they buy? Their question well, becomes like why do I not just print it myself? But I mean I think that the thing is is that that. The way we're going to measure, you know, why don't you just do Google yourself? You know, why don't you do that? Because you can't. Because right. to make that work, you need to have a thousand computers to work. And to make to make a, you know, right now you can make drinking cups, spoons, and simple sort of things. You can't make an iPhone with a 3D printer. Five years from now, you might be able to make today's current iPhone with a 3D printer, but you're not going to produce, you know, the microprocessor that's a thousand times more powerful with an over-the-counter desktop 3D printer. You're going to still need a million-dollar machine because the precision levels will get there. So we're going to go for all this low-hanging fruit like we do in overseas. There are certain things you don't buy. Let's say, like, you know, China isn't known for necessarily, let's say, jet engine parts or certain kinds of, you know, computer components because you need to go to Korea or Japan for those because they have the proficiency and the tooling to be able to do that and it takes certain kinds of tolerances. So yeah, there will be like if you're making stuff that anybody can make out, yeah, why 
why do it when somebody can make it? So you have to keep kind of making these things. I guess I guess that's what I'm hitting. Uh, what I'm hinting at is that there's this kind of constant, uh, you know, trading up the chain. This this complexity where it's like mm-hmm. you got to stay one step ahead if you want if you want to make mm-hmm. a buck. Yeah, if I wanted to build like a 3D replicating factory right now, this, I've been talking about this, you know, all weekend is the idea that I would design it. I would I would try to amortize everything over two years, assuming every two years you need to swap out your 3D printers for the next gen one because in two years time. It'll be easily, you know, the, what you can buy at home, whatever. But, you know, I agree. Yeah. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Oh, I did it again. I pressed stop. I should just let it go. Uh, are, are we doing after things? Because I know that we got uh, uh, schedule stuff. And uh, if I'm going to eat dinner, it's going to happen. Well, yeah, Bonnie said dinner's at 6. So okay. uh, any any after things thing would have to be a little uh, abbreviated. Do, okay. We should do a way. We should do something because yeah. it's a uh, promise. All right. Well, I'm going to run Okay. And here. We're all we're all fine here. Everybody's okay. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I went to go see at the uh, the EMP museum. They have the uh, in Seattle. They have the Star Wars costume exhibit. Uh oh! Wow, you got to see all the original costumes. Well, it was on two floors. The first floor was the prequels. Oh, that's... <laughs> the second floor was to go see some of the original series ones, and there was a bit of a line. And I look up there, and I'm like, you know what? Um, I could just get the book on the costumes. I paid like twenty bucks a head or whatever to go see it, and I yeah. just walked out. I that's, was like, it's like lines, dude. I don't blame you. I don't do lines. Um, hey, uh, uh, I'm gonna run downstairs and use the restroom uh, and grab a soda. But uh, Neshcom needs a title. Uh, Apes of Mars. Um, I will be honest with you, Tensor guy, as far as that museum, I was extremely underwhelmed and disappointed. I thought it looked very pretty on the outside. Um, I have a thing about museums where they have an item and then a bunch of textual information all around it. Uh, I've been to smaller, tinier, less funded museums that I got far, far more out of. It was literally like somebody wrote a paycheck to buy some neat things. And then I thought the assemblage of everything there was just not up to what it could have been. What are you talking about? The EMP Museum in Seattle. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's pretty much, like, from what I know of it, kind of the the the, the deal with it, right? You know. It's, well, they 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 have like they give me that they have like they have this you know, like indie video game project, right? Which is all our indie video game, which is like all these sort of the, the history of independent video games. Yeah. You walk in there, and it's like a dozen computers, LCD screens that you can sit down and play. And then some abstract art thing, and then then a couple videos playing on walls that tell you, you know, people talking heads telling you stories. And it's like, how is this better than an iPad app? You yeah. know, how is this better? It felt like it, 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 I walked out of there. I'm like, it's like a GD CES booth. It just was yeah. not, you know, without without a helpful person explaining stuff. I've been the, there's like the Computer History Museum in Mo- Bozeman, Montana, of all places, was far more impressive and amazing. What they could cram into one little room there. Yeah. I was just, it, this to me was just like, this is just, everything there was like, here's this. Now here's a bunch of text and here's a video of somebody explaining it. There was no storytelling in the placement. There was no, it was such a disappointment. I was really, I was angry when I left. Wow. Yeah. I, it's so interesting. Like that, that whole genre is, is, you know, we, uh, we, we've been to the, the, the Disney museum in San Francisco, which I mean, talk about bringing you into you know, this, this, you know, man's life and, and really interesting visual mm-hmm. ways of telling the story room by room, having those themed, having it, uh, you know, th- there certainly is a necessary element of listen to somebody tell you a story, but every, you know, the, the ways that they did that were so varied and interesting that, uh, it was oh, yeah. That- yeah. Where this, this museum, like the question was, can you play the games? And yeah, you could, if you could, if you could wait long enough for somebody to get out of the way to let you sit down and play one of the games, Yes, you could in theory play a game and do that, but it was just you know a bunch of kids sitting there playing the games, which is fine. But it was like there was just, it was like I walked to like like have the game running on the computer. Somebody made it, you know. Show me like show me the work desk of where the person who made this game. Let me let me see what their life was like and create that little environment. Tell me this little story about that. They have a horror film thing. I'm like, oh cool, this should be great. And it's you know a bunch of props and then you know Eli Roth and some people on the wall talking about you know horror films. I'm like. 
show me, you know, show me what Eli Roth's dorm room was like, or yeah. show me, you know, create a set from one of these movies and show me the elements from that went in there, like you know, from oh, you know, uh, The Exorcist, like no, like recreate, you know, Blair, you know, recreate that Reagan's room or whatever, create this sort of thing. Let me walk through and see what this experience is like because everything else. It was a, just a coffee table book. It was just a yeah. coffee table book put up on walls. I was just, I was so, I was so excited about the potential. And now I see why the museum isn't this. People don't rave about it because yeah. it's just. Well, and it's it really it, it its greatest uh, achievement is is its procurement. You know, like mm-hmm. that's that's what they have uh, are known for is just like they are really great and aggressive. Uh, and you know, grossly so. If you listen to people, although an unreliable narrator like Courtney Love uh, has been very, very critical about how uh, aggressive and, if not downright sleazy, they've been about you know getting artifacts and stuff like that of of the yeah. modern era. But this is a uh, oh, uh, this is the the rock and roll no museum, the, the EMP the Experience Music Project. Wait, is that that's in Seattle? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they've got the science fiction. Uh, was it uh, uh, Paul Allen? Is that who? Yeah. Financed? Okay, yeah. Got it. Uh, hey, man, I'm ready to start after thing. Th- <clears throat> take two. Uh, I'm ready to start after things. Whenever you say go. Go. This is what happens when you wait for somebody else to take the initiative. <laughs> Everybody sits and waits for somebody to take the initiative. <laughs> that is our first lesson on after things. Hey, that's, that's actually that's that whole uh, you know the victim who kept screaming, "Somebody help me! Somebody help me!" And then everyone you know, thirty people in earshot, nobody lifts a finger. And that's why in an emergency, you point to one person and say, "You in the green shirt." Hand me, you know, that uh, defibrillator. You and that the was the are, apocryphal right. story of the victim, where it turns out that numerous calls were made to nine one one, but it made a better narrative to say that in the middle well, of the city, everybody was indifferent. Right, but 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 certainly the the studies seem to indicate that picking out a particular person is is more yes, effective. Yes, yes, that, that was yeah. the, I believe it was Kitty Genovese was the story of what happened, and then that there are people who went back later on and said no. The people around were not these, you know, uh, uh, and because any any given town, you're going to have. You're going to have the busy buddies who are always on the phone calling in for that, but absolutely, certainly point to somebody and assign responsibility. Yeah. But that was uh, in the Queens, New York in 1964, and it was the local newspaper article said the lack of reaction from the neighbors. Um, uh, and that was the – because they said, oh, they were indifferent and all this, and it turns out like, no, we called, we did this and all that stuff. And it was – and it may have been a case too where the city wanted to blame the people instead of the response time or whatever too. Yeah, man, right. it's weird to know how much of those stories. Oh shoot, we forgot. Yeah, to we'll do talk our about retra- that on here. We'll talk about that. Okay, here. yeah, we uh, we uh, we forgot to do our retraction, so we'll do it. We'll do it right here. I we was, don't need to do a full retraction. We I think we were we we covered our butts ever so slightly, perhaps. A, a, a clarification. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think all right. So all right, let, let, let's go through it, and then we can talk about why. Uh, you know, I I I think we handled everything very tongue in cheek. So I don't know if we necessarily reported it as as. As fact, but yes, but let's go ahead and, and go through it. Uh, oh man, let me look for. Uh, let me set the search tools to the last week. Now, I'm, as Brian looks for this, I want to clarify. Yeah. Often on the internet, we love to be outraged. We love to be outraged, yeah. particularly nerd outrage. And I remember, like, you know, there was the story. Like, we had this whole thing, like Star Wars Day, because some kid was told that you know Star Wars wasn't for girls or whatever. Right. Yeah, and right, this right, thing right. became this massive outpouring. And for all we know. One eight-year-old boy said this. Yeah. yeah. Yet it became this, we got to rally. And like, of course, I mean, when I played Star Wars kids, it was boys and girls. We all played Star Wars, you know, yeah. but we wanted to be upset about something. So, we, you know, the idea that, ah, this male culture, whatever, is not letting her play this. Maybe. Maybe that was the case there. But it was like, as far as we know, one little boy told a girl, it's for boys when right. he's wrong. Well, and, and keep in mind, I'm not so much worried about our integrity or that we got anything wrong. It's we just have that nothing to worry about. Ab- ab- yeah. upon, upon seeing this story, uh, if, I, I thought it was an interesting, you know, rest of the story to get from, like, the exact Absolutely. details. Because we were definitely singing the praises of this kid who, uh, turns out, maybe was not as cool as we thought he was. I still think it's a pretty all cool faith. I'm so... <laughs> Well, it says here, uh, what we described was that he was unfairly... Um, uh, maligned because he, you know, said he was going to make someone disappear, and it got interpreted as a death threat or whatever. Well, it, specifically, he was going to. He was a fan of Lord of the Rings, or just watched Lord of the Rings, and he was going to uh, put the One Ring on the kid and make him disappear. Correct, correct. That was that was what got everybody all hot and bothered, and, and we were talking about how, uh, you know, because again, these are the reason why these things take frame, right? The Star Wars Day thing. 
Somebody was told that this is for guys and not for girls. So now, uh, you know, women and, and men who have been disenfranchised based on other people's opinions see themselves in the little girl and get righteously angry because we would like to think that when we were children and going through this, that if a big rallying cry of adults came to our aid, it would have made us feel good. In this case, it was some kid who had a gigantic imagination and we see ourselves in uh, that kid because at eight, we imagine ourselves uh, having that same drive. Right. Well, it says here, according to the uh, actual documentation, the kid's version is he was playing with magic. Kids got mad because uh, I bitten some friends is what it looks like. And uh, the teacher's version, however, said that he told another student that he was going to put his magic rings around his neck and hope he died, uh, which is a little bit more aggressive. <laughs> Oh, my God, it's still magical. Still, <laughs> <laughs> still play with magic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Although, I don't know if this necessarily takes us out of the point we were making. Because what we have as counterfactual evidence is a report from the teacher. So, unless the teacher was overhearing exactly what was said, it is... People, other kids going to tell the teacher why, you know, somebody is upset. Right. And the teacher is summarizing what she can best deduce and writing that down. Right. Right. Who knows exactly what was said. Correct. Right. Well, like, and, and, and almost certainly neither of the two versions is correct. That's the one thing that uh, that is uh, the, the bitterest pill that is. um did we did we talk about the whole Brian Williams thing last week yes. on After Things? In, 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 okay, in good. intricate detail. All right, well, I've, I've, I've talked about it a lot lately. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like just don't, don't trust your stupid squishy. Well, brains. but also here's here's the thing: you have you have kids around this age. You have likely looked at incident reports, like either involving your kids directly or around your kids, or your kids telling you about stuff. Right. It turns out that that does not become clearer when you elevate it to a national story <laughs> and wrap our own personal identities of fans. Add, in, adding uh, more links of, to of the, the chain doesn't uh, doesn't make it stronger, huh? Turns out that who that, knew? Yeah, that that this one uh, doesn't exactly. It is just as unclear as any incident report that comes in involving a dispute on the playground between two eight-year-olds. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. So at any rate, uh, to elaborate. Uh, uh, he w apparently wished someone died. Is what? Oh, we, is. And, and like anything, you know, uh, we we have this rush to have opinions before we have facts, and that's that's one of the. And, and we're guilty of that. We're guilty of that. Let's we'll just call it right there that that that, that our that our emotions certainly took one side, and we may have put caveats there, but emotionally we were we were you know singing the praises of this kid, uh, and it's still like I look at that like listen. Put a ring around her. I, I wish anybody to die is wrong. You know, telling anybody they can't enjoy something is wrong. And so, I mean, unless it's putting a ring around your neck and telling you to die, no, you can't enjoy that. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 make it clear to that point. Um, but that is a thing that's frustrating. Is that that I, you see something happen and then you get a you get that quick the first the first you know blurb such and such in shooting in here New York City or shooting in DC or this or that. And then people rushing to just make comments on stuff with no facts, no this, and probably this. It probably reinforces whatever my view of the world, and that drives me nuts because we never know. We never know. Things happen, incidents happen, and then you know, days and weeks go by before we finally get the information. You know, whether it's incidents is you know alleged police brutality or whatever. You know, we're so quick to it reinforces what we believe, and sometimes it's real, sometimes it's not. But the more emotional we get without evidence. It delegitimizes. Oh, certainly you know. so. And, and what I think gets lost when these, when you have these conversations, is that it doesn't invalidate your thoughts or your feelings or even your intuitions, which, like, although dangerous when when acted upon at times, are certainly valid and important to our own, you know, decision making process. Like, what hurts things is when you just look at something that you only have X amount of idea about. And then you assign all of your personal narratives on top of it. You know, it, 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 I don't think it makes it clear to understand what might be sticky situations, which uh, oftentimes have people's entire lives wrapped up in them. Uh, it doesn't make your argument any stronger to, uh, you know, look at things and, and blow up situations that might 
hurt you. And also, it doesn't make your arguing power any stronger. The next time you go talk to somebody and the only thing they can remember is when you got super hot and bothered about something that turned out to be not exactly what it was. I mean, chill, baby. Everything's going to come out in the wash. Like, and you're and you don't have to think that you are any less right than you are. You know, like you can be true to your own convictions and not jump on literally everything to say, yup, just see. Well, and it's I, not like it's not like that that changes anyone's minds. I mean, that's that's the that's the part that I don't get is 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 that, uh, um, uh, you know, it's it's not like you're like, well, you finally boxed me in with your argument. The the first 800 articles you forwarded me about Obama uh, being the devil didn't take, but the 801st one finally sold it. It's like they, <laughs> they, they said no one ever. I mean, it's I don't know. It's insane. Uh, although I will say that if there is a podcast and an enterprise that has uh, trumpeted very loudly, uh, you know, in this safe space, in this sweet hour and change, the triumph of opinions and emotions over facts. It, it is this show, you know, like we, we talk very, very loudly about how, you know, Bigfoot is not real. He's awesome, you know, and we can talk about that and get lost in that and make connections based on that uh, without sacrificing the fact that like, we don't need to caveat at the end of every sentence, but he's not real. I mean, he's not real. I mean, what, right guys, you know, he's not real. Like it's. I'm not so sure anymore, guys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we ain't been what you've been through, man. Uh, and, and so, like, I don't know. It's occasionally. I'm gonna change topic. We get emails after things. People have question requests, and I've been looking through this last 20 minutes trying to find this email because I don't want to do after things without addressing it. And this is from Marcin, and I don't think we addressed this on the last one. He's from Poland, and he uh, really enjoys the after things and he wants to know if the part the residents in the greatly and he wonders if you or justin or brian could write or speak more about how to approach new projects and choose what to do in life professionally he says i really want to know more about that don't paralyze yourself by thinking there is a best answer the only there are only wrong answers and the wrongest answer is to not place a foot forward like if you become comfortable right now with knowing that over the course of your life, you will begin things that you think you will love only to discover that you don't love them. And then you will pivot and change directions and go somewhere else. Then you can start moving and you can move in any direction as long as it's generally towards or generally in the direction of where you want to be. And you will be happy with the results. You will not be happy if you expect number one, that there is of, of one single thing for you and you have to discover it. That was the biggest mistake I made. I spent all of my college time thinking that I Drunk. was, uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, <laughs> that was too much of a knowing nod. Uh, the, uh, uh, I spent the whole time thinking I was getting away with something because I managed to, you know, do this magic thesis as a thing. So I was able to take classes on like, Oh, look at me. I never really had to pick a, a single thing to focus on. Ha ha. Pulled a fast one on you. Turns out, uh, university pulled a fast one on me because I went on to do magic for the next 15 years. Whether I wanted <laughs> to... the administrative office. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, but, but it's like the whole time I thought I was getting away with not working, uh, you know, doing the boring stuff and doing this, what I thought was easy stuff at the time. Turns You're out that it... Universal Studios doing your show and some fat cat administrators are peering around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> going, yeah. we, got, <laughs> we got another one, Edna. <laughs> exactly. I know. Big Texas hats. <laughs> Bolo ties. <laughs> uh, yeah, Brian's but, up on stage. Clink, 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 clink. <laughs> uh, we tricked him into realizing his dreams. <laughs> uh, so, so at any rate, that's that's my advice on that. Like, uh, like just, just, just start. Just go. Uh, I'm gonna assume that this uh, email writer, as all of our listeners are, uh, have above average intelligence. Yeah. And I will say, do not repeat. Do not fall into the curse of the smart person. Oh, God. The curse of the smart person is believing that they can think out the entire roadmap to happiness or to success or to completion before they take a step forward. You know, you got to you got to hang on loosely at times and, and understand. And this is again, this is like the second level. First, always move forward. Always keep doing something. Don't give yourself excuses on why this is not the right thing to do. Just try it. 
even if it's a dumb move, it's gonna you're gonna learn something better. The second level on that, in my opinion, is when you are going ahead, don't let yourself feel the the crushing weight of oh my plan wasn't correct oh, God. and that saps your enthusiasm for doing something like just don't worry about every step you know have a long term plan but understand that that can fall apart and that can be uh that that can be affected and if you make that change the enemy of your ego because it means you're wrong or it means you put too much effort in planning into the wrong direction then you can find yourself too rigid and uh, it, it makes the whole process less fun. I'll tell you what, man. I like the idea of having a plan. I like the idea of it's 10 steps long, have an 11 step that says one of the above 10 steps is almost certainly wrong. And I will be on the lookout for which one it is along the way. Yeah. Another, another problem when you're intelligent and you're creative is you pursue something you're excited about. And the first time it becomes difficult you'll creatively come up with reasons not to do it and why you need to change your plan. Yeah. That's the problem is if you're smart and creative, you're smart and creative enough to realize that it's less effort to make up a really good reason why it happened this way or why you're right or justify or mm -hmm. rationalize. Um, this was uh, another Michael uh, Crichton speech. He talks about um, there are simulations where people are put in, in charge of simulated cities and they found time and time again that those who came in with preconceived notions and plans and, um, you know, they, they, they got their philosophy, they, they've got it all figured out, and uh, the system starts to go off the rails, but they rationalize and they explain like, oh, well, that's going to work out because this, because it's right, and just double down on the method that I came up with. And then it all goes to crap, whereas the people who do very well are the ones who remain nimble, the ones who recognize trends early, who see where things are headed, that, that drop strategies and correct uh, on the fly. Those are the people that do well. You know that you've seen that investment strategies. You know the average mutual fund performs worse than the index, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, because we this is our policy. This is what we're going to do, and and they just second guess everything along the way, and that's problematic. And people build up a theory that no, I think the theory is right, but it's not really a tested scientific theory. Um, that's a problem. I would say if you're looking for what to do, this is my advice. First, take an inventory of what you're good at and what you enjoy being good at. We can be good at many, many things. When I was a kid, one of my first jobs, my first job ever is I worked at a movie theater and I cleaned bathrooms. I was really good. Get out that, get that, this orange cleanser stuff that was this weird, tangy, citrusy selling stuff. Clean the bathrooms, clean the toilets. I was pretty good at that because I was just like, I, I, I got to make sure this thing looks good. Did not want to make a career out of that. No. So that was not going to be a career. I was also into magic, and I liked doing magic. I liked magic better than cleaning toilets. So as soon as I got the chance to 14 years, I worked, started working at like movie theater cleaning bathrooms 14 years old. I also, you know, I'd clean the bathroom, then I would serve your concessions, just so you know how that works. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you, you realize, where do you want to go from there? And you can look at what you're good at and say, what do I enjoy being good at? And that narrows it down. Then you can look at things that maybe you want to do, but you don't have the skills, but you said, you know what? I'd like to have the skills for that. I never took a class on Photoshop, but now I'm pretty good at Photoshop. I can do a lot of amazing things with Photoshop because I like to sit down and do that. I've become that way with 3D design. I like to do 3D CAD, things like that for fun, and I know a lot more now than I did before because spending three or four hours doing 3D CAD design is fun for me. It's relaxing. I'll do this for fun. I'll listen to an audio book. So that's a direction. So if I were you know, me... 15 years ago or whatever, and I was looking for options, I might say, well, where can I do this? Maybe I want to go into industrial design. Maybe I want to go do that. Who knows? But take a look at what you're good at. Draw circles around what you like to do. Take a look at the things that you want to do, and you think you might want to learn those skills and move those towards those directions, and then things fall into place for you. Yeah, and it uh, again, like you know, there ain't there ain't no one way to get there. It's like if if, if your goal is to well, if you take my course, it, the one way, <laughs> it ain't ain't here. I mean, that's the thing is like you know, there there are entire years of of my life that I'm like looking back on it. I'm like, well, if what I wanted to do is get to where I am now. Uh, that in, in you know uh, this entire two or three year stretch was was largely a step in the wrong direction, et cetera. It's like planned right now to have those stories of what you did wrong. Of mm -hmm. uh, well, but like I think this is the true path to in to to efficiency. You know, like it, it if you can effectively better identify where you might be going off the rails, where things might not be as efficient, where you might be uh, you know, like 
better off changing course, the more you work that muscle and the more you can suppress your ego to uh, to do it, the better you're going to be, the better the better your actual projects, like the more that you can minimize that from two to three years to maybe something shorter, you know, like yeah. it's and, and a lot of times it's hard, like it's hard to pull that band aid off. Like and there's a lot of reasons why, including, you know, money, time, effort, ego, self-confidence, friendships like there's a million different reasons why, you know, it might make more sense to make the right decision. Uh, and the better you can be at that, I think the, th that's the mark of the most successful people I know are, are the people that make those decisions faster than others. All right. I have a pick for you all. And it can just come with a caveat in that it'll, it, it's worth listening to because there's some interesting information in there. But you also understand how fast things change and how quickly things can move. And I read this book when it first came out like six years ago, seven years ago. And uh, – since then, or five years ago, since then, let me just, rather than pulling numbers up, I'm going to uh, give you an exact number. The world has moved fast. There's a lot of good information in there. Some of that information is not as relevant, and some of the the, the theories and put forth by the, the speculation put forth. 2009 is when this came out, okay? Um I'm talking about the book Free by Chris Anderson, editor of Wired Magazine. And Chris Anderson's wrote the book The Long Tail, which we now know isn't quite as, re isn't quite as accurate as we thought. The world moved more towards tent poles and less away from long tail things. But Free is the idea of trying to explain kind of the state of the Internet economy and how things became radically free. Now, what's cool about Free, you can actually get this book for free. The audio book is available for free, so you can listen to it. But you'll see him do things in there like question Facebook and say things like, well, when I ask people, you know, how much they'd pay for Facebook for to keep their account, and everybody says nothing, which makes me think that maybe Facebook really isn't worth anything and they're just going to have to keep advertising and support themselves. It was just bought, and he says, you know, Microsoft invested at it in it for an evaluation of one point eight billion dollars. Maybe they overpaid. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, and and yes. Uh, by the way, I just listened to Free like uh, six months ago for the first time, uh, and and I found the same thing. There are a few moments that are a little bit dated, but by and large, I think uh -huh. he's absolutely right. Like whatever it is you want to do, there should be a free component to it. There should be well, sure. a way. Sure, but I think that I think I would add a couple caveats. So to say, like, listen, Facebook is now worth two hundred and twenty-three billion dollars, and it is incredibly successful. And I was a skeptic of Facebook about this and all that, but there was a, they they knew something we didn't know, and there was a thing that they, uh, there was much more growth there than Anderson. And Anderson's dismissiveness towards it is the reason to say, like, listen, this guy's smart, but he doesn't even see that. Another thing in there, though, is when he talked about, like, I'm writing this on my netbook, da 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 da, and it's supported by this. Da. In the wake of the Lenovo thing that just happened with, like, Smartfish yeah. or whatever, if those of you that aren't aware. Well, I actually missed this. Uh, I assume this was probably covered by uh, Daily Tech News Show. Uh, certainly so, yeah. I, I didn't get a chance to go in depth on it. So, Andrew. So, what happened is recently, in the last week or so, um, somebody realized they looked at, they had a Lenovo notebook, and they were looking at something that was going on with the uh their ads were being replaced on google oh wow well, they go into our they look they looked at all of a sudden that uh the ads were being replaced on google and certain other places that it started to different ads were popping up instead of the uh, what was supposed to be there and what happened is that lenovo as staff put in rooted created a thing called superfish rather superfish was an ad partner they partnered with and superfish created a application that functioned on there that gave a bogus security certificate that wasn't as secure as it should have been, which mean that everybody who had this, every Lenovo notebook that had this and had this on there was very vulnerable to hacking. So you thought you're having a secure connection. You weren't. Your passwords, everything else is being transmitted. Now it's been cracked. It's out there in the open. They installed this adware to subsidize the cost of the notebooks, and it turns out that it just hugely compromised the security. It is considered... You know, back in like 2005, Sony released some sort of like, you know, worm or virus on some of their pirated soft pirated versions of their software to, you know, hurt systems. It's considered the worst thing since then. Now, Lenovo has been approached for their statement on it, and they're like, ah, oh, they're trying to downplay it. But the, the thing is, they put software in there that, number one, 
overtook whatever ad network that you're supposed to be seeing when you're on Google or wherever else, which one is wrong. Two, compromise the security of your laptop, of your computer to the point that somebody else, a third party, could very, very easily hack into what you're doing. It was what appears to be a lie. It was very dishonest. And that's the danger because this is how they subsidize the cost of the notebooks to keep these things down. And so in the light of free, understand that when you're constantly trying to figure out how to keep things cheap, 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 and you're in this price war of nothing, how far do you go? Well, we saw that with Lenovo where what they were doing is they were willing to compromise user security to provide a product that did this. Um, well, and so, I think part of what, and especially in the era when that book was written, part of the lessons, and I haven't read it to be fair, uh, mm -hmm. But what Free was very good at at that very specific point in time was finding the path of least resistance on how people wanted to mm -hmm. consume stuff. And that is a lesson that I think has rang clarion clear and continues mm -hmm. to build. That, I that, like, you know, for example, we're going to do this thing later tonight on, on DiamondClub.tv where we're going to watch the, the, the WWE uh, pay-per-view. And Brian's going to uh, be here with me. And the reason why I've started doing those is because it's very cheap. And easy for me to get the WWE Network, which is sold via an app over the top. I'm not paying for pay-per-views, which I never really wanted to do. Uh, and that is a great way that that, you know, that that has now found uh, something to do. And and that's, you know, uh, there was a boom of watching these things pirated and illegal because they were cheaper than what you would normally do. And it was where you needed it to be. Now there is a bit of a middle ground where I'm willing to pay something and it has spurred growth on, on how people do it. So it's like, I think there, there is a lesson there that has continued to evolve that I don't necessarily think is exactly tied to it being no cost, but right. Uh, the, the, and, and I, and the reason I recommend the book and as Brian pointed out, understanding like models like free meme and stuff. And part of the point that Anderson makes, and it's a very, very, again, again, I am absolutely recommend, highly recommending the book, but to show you how thing, if you follow things to their extension, you can see certain things and go, Oh, this isn't the way we thought, but the, the thesis is absolutely relevant. Not everything has to be the model where you're being sold to advertisers, though. You know, that, that's the big model. That's the way Google works, and that's why we're all a little bit hesitant about every time we use some new Google services. They won't sell it to me because they would much rather turn around and sell my information or access to that information yeah. to a third party, mm -hmm. which gets – it's a trade-off. But yeah. as Brian mentioned, freemium. Freemium is a great model because freemium says if you can make something super cheap, and that's what's the beautiful thing about free, because of, as Brian points out, servers and everything, the cost falls so much – I can have a million free riders and I can have a thousand people pay for a slightly better experience. That's what's beautiful about where we are now. Absolutely. And you can, yeah, that's, that's the key point is that it doesn't then have to be, and those million I advertise to, maybe I do, maybe I do, or it's hard when it's physical stuff where you really have to get 30 or 40 bucks out of every person to offset the cost. But when it's digital and you can just give it away and create enough people to keep the rest of it going. Well, and, and here's, here's the, the real news flash is if you don't give it away, then they will, somebody will take it and steal it. And it will be, you know, whether it happens with your permission or not, it's going to happen there. Or a competitor will give it a, a diversion, the freeway, you know? Yeah. Uh, in the chat room, tensor guy says, if you pay nothing, then the product is you. And that's a, that's a popular soundbite that I see a lot. And the more, I think my position has really evolved on that where it's like, I'm not so jaded because I think about all the open source projects that have happened. I think about, I don't think anyone got screwed over by Linux. I think Linux was a, is <laughs> Sorry, Microsoft. <laughs> well, well, yeah, exactly. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, I, I think that participating in Linux, uh, only did good and you can genuinely yeah. have everything be free and you're not being swindled. They're not, you know, maybe, you know, you can you could make a claim that they're duping you for free you know contributions to the effort, but I don't. I well, don't but really I think buy that. I, I think that's that, that it doesn't have to be the product is you. Like it's not an yeah. evil thing, but yeah. like yeah, no, the product is you if you are, if if you are a Linux, you you are effectively participating in this thing, and the you are an engineer, you are an engine to make that product better. Now the fact that they don't want to monetize it is their own decision, but. Uh, or is it that that's the spirit of the project? But like, I think it is something that you should remember in an era of a lot of these companies that are advertising companies giving you free products. Yeah, I think yeah, exactly. I think not every free model means, and then I sell my my customer data to advertisers. Many of them, the most popular one, Google is, 
what is we talk about freemium games and stuff like that is that they can be at freemium games where the, the emphasis is on the imp- meum is the idea that we get you in and the game is its own advertisement for you to want to upgrade and do that. But there are a lot of freemium games out there where you can have a wonderful experience and you never need to pay a couple bucks to do it. But they make it, you know, the ones where you feel like you have to and then you feel raped by it aren't such a great idea. Yeah. But those are great examples of saying, no, like our goal is we can, we can create an experience that costs us almost next to nothing for 99% of the people who use it. And that 1% who want that little more subsidize everybody else the product is, you know, and that's there's there are a lot of models like that. I think that's the thing to look at is besides just and then we sell you to an advertiser because there's there is only a to- there's a total volume of advertising dollars out there that's going to shrink and shrink or percentage wise it's going to decline and you still have to end up creating value. You know, Apple's a company that said we're going to go create value. We're going to really try to sell that, put value into our product and sell on the idea of value. And now it's the most it's the richest, that's, it's the most valuable con- con- you know, company in the world. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen is that people are going to realize like when you buy advertisements, what you're doing is you are renting somebody else's value. Somebody else has created value. You're going to inefficiently borrow some of that value, borrow that eyebrow, uh, those eyeballs, and, uh, and you're going to lose 90% of the people's attention because it's not the thing that they wanted to come see, but enough of them will go there that they'll see your thing mm-hmm. and maybe they'll buy, buy your product or service mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, we're moving to a, a world where it's like, oh, wait, we could take that same million dollars of advertising and instead start a foundation that uh, or, or start a podcast or start a workshop or host maker events or, or do whatever that reaches out to the exact community that is interested in exactly this product. And then along the way, you know, because that, I mean, to be honest, that's what we're doing with uh, scam school and scam stuff. Scam school is free and you could get into ad supported because it's in partnership with, uh, with discovery, but, but scam school is the wide part of the pyramid base. And then above it is, you know, people who are interested, you know, along the way, I'm going to say like, Hey, if you like this stuff, you got a few, you know, uh, spare bucks. Here's some more advanced things you can do. And enough of those people come over that it makes it worth it for me to continue to do, uh, you know, to do scam school. We will encourage oh, you to, to continue. continue. Yeah. Another another example I give is Android. You know, Android has become a first worry, fantastic operating system. Um that is, you know, wonderful features, wonderful capabilities. It's, you know, I'm, I'm an iPhone guy, but you know, I play with Android. I get why people like it and why it's a preference for it. And I think that they're not, you're not wrong to like either one. You're, it's, it's a personal choice. But it is, it's become very, very fantastic, and it's essentially free. Now, Google hopes that you will use the Google services when you get it, and you use those Google things. They can monetize. Google still makes more money on iPhone users than they do on Android users, wow. which – it has to deal with sort of selection, but they're able to make that free, that part of Android absolutely free, and that's why you can have hundred dollar phones that blow away anything anybody was making four years ago. Yeah, you know, except for like maybe the material construction. But the point is, is you can you can make amazing technologies now on top of free stuff because there's enough for Google. There's enough money in the services on top of that that they can make the, the core operating system free. And so that's a great example of how the world gets to benefit by that. You know, somebody in the middle of nowhere gets to have a fantastically capable smartphone compared to what they had a couple of years ago because of the how, you know, the, the, the attitude of let's make Android free. Yeah. Uh, hey, man, I, I we're, we're, we're going to wrap up. Our time, yeah. yeah. Yep. All right, guys. It's been after. You're goddamn right. Also Hearthstone. Freemium. Done right. That's the go. Save, copy, ads. Dun, 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 dun. When are you heading back to LA? Monday. Nice. Monday. If I make it out of here, guys. Alive. Oh, guess who I did her with last night? Uh, Dark this? Wizard. Dark Wizard Dan Derricks. Oh, great. How's he doing? Doing good. It's doing good. Nice. I'm gonna be up there in in two weeks. I gotta talk to him. About, uh, uh, um. <clears throat> uh. There's an ice cream shop you gotta go to. Uh, like salty and sweet or whatever. Uh, Pretty amazing. In Portland. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which by the way, big shout out. Uh, the the Go Game did a zombie survival game yesterday. Oh wow. Oh wow. Oh wow. Uh, so Portland. Um, no Uber. What? Oh, of course not. In the land where you can't pump your own gas. Why on earth yeah. would you be allowed to call your own Uber? 
No, no. And they wear knit hats here like it's crazy. I was joking to Justin that, like, they should give them out at the airport like Hawaii does lays. You know, it's like. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You, you want to know what? I guess it's been. I know Seattle got it because Seattle didn't have it for a little Seattle bit. Had Seattle had it. Seattle has it. But it's all radio cab, right? That's their, the, the big Portland cab situation. Oh, I don't know what I wouldn't know. I wouldn't. Yeah. I won't take a cab in a city that doesn't allow Uber. <laughs> I know. Well, Portland's one of the few cities that I've. They're close enough to the airport. Downtown is close enough to the airport that for Go Games, I've not rented a car because it's yeah. just it, it's super expensive to park downtown. So yeah. I'll I'll uh, I'll go in like that. But yeah, no, that's it's stupid. The one thing about Portland is a great place to buy. I think I, I bought two iPads in Portland just because there's no sales tax. There is that. There is that. All right. I bought this one in stupid San Francisco. <laughs> you paid a billion dollars. Yeah. Dun, dun. Well, because I left my other one on the stupid plane, which yeah. uh, was on its way to Portland. Although ah. definitely got stolen in San Francisco because somebody turned it on and it uh, pinged my found my iPhone thing uh, right next to Golden Gate Park. And then went off never to be seen again. Bum, 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 bum. It is how you say womp womp. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Martian Apes is uploading now, and we're going to run downstairs and eat, and I guess we'll be live here again in about 42 minutes. Something like that. All right, all right gentlemen. Thank you. Shh. Dude, great show, man. Good times. All right, bye. 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 Uh, we will be back later. Top of the hour. Top of the hour to you. Ah, ta ta ta.